Please note, this episode contains mentioning of violence, molestation, and language that some people might find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. Happy Friday, Donuts. Welcome to another episode of Fried Dough, your weekly fix of true crime. I'm your girl, Gina, and I am very excited to have you here with me today. If you're new to the Fried Dough community, welcome. We are a group of true crime enthusiasts who come together to explore the most fascinating cases out there. And to my regular Donuts, thank you for your continued support and loyalty. I really do appreciate it, and I see you. But before we jump into today's story, I want to remind you to follow this podcast along with reviewing it on whatever podcast platform you're listening to me right now on. And join our community on Instagram at Fried Dough Podcast. And also, you can reach out at Fried Dough at MyYahoo.com with your thoughts, feedback, and your case suggestions. And as always, I want to remind listeners that the stories that I cover on this podcast may be difficult to hear. However, it is very important to shine a light on these cases and remember the victims who were affected. This is Fried Dough, true crime podcast, and this is the story of Carrie Stainer. Carrie Stainer, born Carrie Anthony Stainer, August 12, 1961, in Merced, California. His mother was named Kay, and his father was Delbert Stainer. Kay, as a child, spent time in a Lutheran boarding school and was physically and emotionally abused there. This made her turn against the church and towards the Mormon religion. Also, because of this, Kay says she couldn't get into the hugging and kissing thing, and she really couldn't get into the touchy-feely thing. So her love language became to be a pristine caregiver. So she made sure her children were well-clothed, well-taken care of, and her whole family was well-fed. She ran a daycare along with working in the high school as a cafeteria lady. However, Dale, perhaps, was a little too touchy-feely. He worked as a mechanic, and he was ordered into treatment after being accused of sexually molesting one of his daughters. I really couldn't find which one, but it really doesn't matter. After Stephen's kidnapping, Kay says she never left the house, and when she did, she never did it alone, and someone had to always be at the house. She said just in case Stevie came home. Dale said, I went berserk at that time. I drove around with a shotgun on the passenger seat just in case I saw someone with Stevie. I started to suspect everyone, including family, neighbors, and friends. He continued, if a child dies, you bury the child. If he leaves, you just continue to have a knot in your chest and it never goes away. For those of you that haven't heard episode nine yet, Stephen Stainer, I'm going to give you a little bit of recap. For seven years, Stephen, Carrie's little brother, lived as a sex slave until February 14, 1980, when Timmy White was abducted. They snatched Timmy up so quickly that his paper valentines fell to the ground while he was on his way to his babysitter's house. Stephen was 14 years old, and he was afraid for Timmy. So he waited one night until their abductor, Kenneth Parnell, went to work for his third shift job, and they both hitchhiked to Ukiah Police Station. Before the disappearance of Stephen, the family went on summer month camping trips in the National Park, including Yosemite, located just a short distance from where the family lived. After many silent prayers, Carrie heard of his brother's escape while returning from a camping trip. He said he almost drove off into the Merced River because Stephen was an instant hero 
and had become a celebrity of sorts. The movie made him even bigger. Jealousy grew in Carrie. In the household, all attention turned towards Stephen to everyone else's determined. Dale would tell Carrie, only if you followed your usual routine and just walked home from school with your brother and sister. But when Stephen returned the room Carrie had to himself for the past seven years, he now shared with Stephen. On the day Michael Echoes, the author of I Know My First Name is Stephen, was visiting the home, Kay was setting the table and forgot all about Carrie's setting. Stephen told her, you forgot one. And she turned around and looked because she didn't believe him. Stephen pointed to Carrie and she just said, oh, and grabbed the plate and just set it in front of Carrie. So when Stephen returned, Carrie said they really didn't get along that much. And Carrie said he think because Stephen's head was a little bit bloated and he was receiving so many gifts. Carrie said, I think I was just jealous, that's all. And since the family didn't approve of therapy, the children didn't know how to sort out the feelings they were having. Dale thought that therapy was for the weak. Looking into the surface, you would think that this is what made the Yosemite National Park murderer, Carrie Stainer. But he said that it was there all along, way before the family gained national attention. Carrie said at age seven, he used to imagine killing women in his imagination. He was 11 years old when Stephen went missing. At age three, he was diagnosed with trichotillomania, which is a mental disorder which presents a repeat and uncontrollable urge to pull out body hair. In school, Carrie was a pretty good student. He got pretty good grades and he was also enrolled in the gifted classes. But in almost every high school yearbook, Carrie's name was spelled wrong. They spelled it C-A-R-R-Y. Even the year he was on the yearbook staff, it was also still named wrong. <laughs> That's not funny, but he even got called the wrong name to his face in school. He tried to get everybody to call him by his middle name, Anthony, but it never caught on. He also said his imagination only grew after he became the first Stainer child to be molested by his uncle Jesse Stainer. That incident was only swept up under the rug, but no one was surprised what Jesse did. They just came up with a rule that he wasn't allowed to have boys over his house overnight in his apartment. But again, this incident was predicted long in advance, but no one came to the rescue of Jesse's young victim. George Woods, a psychiatrist, testified that one night Carrie went to spend the night over Uncle Jesse's house and Jesse showed the boys new pictures of women. Jesse and Carrie went to sleep in the same bed and Carrie said that he woke up in the middle of the night to Jesse removing his underwear in attempts to molest him. Jesse was later convicted of this crime, but if Carrie received any attention for this, it was over quickly because attention turned towards Stephen later that year and turned everything upside down. Again, Carrie was 11 years old. At 16 years old, he touched one of his sister's friend's breast who was spending the night and exposed himself to her. The cousin who always spent time at the Stainer home said he would try to hypnotize them and then tell them to take off their clothes. He also would put on a mask, go outside, and try to look through the bathroom window to see if her and her sister were undressing. She said, we made sure that the doors were locked because we knew he was always around somewhere watching. A researcher who created a timeline of Carrie's life at Virginia Radford University said around this time was when Carrie started imagining women being gang raped. Carrie said the only place he felt safe was in the woods. He would go there to hunt, fish, swim, and he also explored caves with his cousin, Ronnie Jones. Carrie really never had a special girl. 
he suffered from erectile dysfunction at this very young age. So he would focus more on the girls he could draw. He created his dream girl on paper. He had lost all his motivation. He said at that time, he had a lot going on in his head. His cousin said he talked about Bigfoot all the time. His cousin said when he would talk about Bigfoot, he would just go blank in the face and you just knew he wasn't joking. So in 1990, he lived with his uncle Jesse. Yeah, that uncle. Jesse taught him how to install windows and hired him at his company, C&S Glass. Christmas that same year, Jesse came home to surprise an intruder. And Carrie got home and he found his Uncle Jesse lying face down in a pool of blood in the doorway to a gunshot room to his chest. Carrie had been ruled out as a suspect because he was at work at the time, but he accused many family members. One of his cousins said that a family member worked very closely with the police about the case and they had suspected someone but didn't have enough evidence to prove it. Some thought Jesse may have found out something dark about Carrie. Carrie never escaped suspicion, and the case remained unsolved. At work one day, Carrie had a mental breakdown and said that he wanted to kill everybody at his job. So a friend of his put him in the car and drove him to a psych center. There, he saw a therapist and was put into a group therapy. But because Carrie was so shy to share, he just left therapy and went back to his job to pick up his last check and went into the woods in Alporta, west of Yosemite Park, and got a job at Cedar Lodge as a handyman. February 14, 1999, Carol's son, 42 years old, 15-year-old Julie's son, Carol's daughter, and their exchange student from Argentina, 16-year-old Sylvania Paleso, check into the Cedar Lodge after leaving the University of Pacific, where Julie had a cheerleading competition along with she toured the campus for when she graduated. They rented a red Pontiac Grand Prix and they got to the hotel a little bit early, so they spent the day taking in the sights, and they also had dinner at the Lodge restaurant. The girls had cheeseburgers and Carol had a veggie burrito before going to their room 504 to watch the movie they rented, Jerry Maguire. When they got to the room, Carol called her husband, Jen, to confirm the time they were supposed to meet the following day at the airport. They planned to go to San Francisco and later Arizona to show Sylvania the Grand Canyon, and I'm so sorry if I'm saying her name wrong. So the next day, her husband was late to the airport but he just thought that he messed up the time and he missed them. He thought he gotten the times wrong, so he went on as planned. He said that Carol was very meticulous about plans and she was never a person that would just change plans at the spur of the moment because she had too many things going on her plate. She never made it to their destination, so he started making calls. His first call was to the rental car agency to confirm that Carol returned the car, but they said that she didn't return the car, nor did she extend the agreement. Then he called Cedar Lodge, only to be told that they have checked out without leaving the room key. He then contacted the park rangers and the police to let them know something was wrong. They initially thought they were in an accident, so they started looking for the three ladies. First, the officers went back to the room to check it out and see what they could find. It hadn't been cleaned yet due to short staff. They discovered a pink blanket and one pillowcase was missing and the key was still sitting in plain sight on the table and a bag of souvenirs left in the room. The FBI was called because Sylvania was an exchange student. They were told that Carol would never take anything from a hotel nor would she leave her souvenirs. It looked as if someone just came in, took a shower, left the towels on the floor, and just left. Jen and her parents 
came to Modesto to conduct their own investigation from a hotel room. So what they started to do first was search for the Red Grand Prix. So while looking for this car, they found 27 other stolen cars, but they did find Carol's wallet on the back road with a little bit of her license and a couple of cards in there. So what happened was February 14, 1999, at about 9 p.m., Carrie started knocking on neighboring doors of 504, yelling maintenance. So when he got to the ladies' room, 504, he did the same thing. And he told Carol that he needed to check the bathroom to make sure there wasn't a leak because a pipe or something busted upstairs and he was checking all of the rooms. Carol didn't want to let him in initially. So Carrie told her, okay, I'll just go and get the manager and we'll come back. So at that time, Carol decided to let him in the room. Carrie came in, went into the bathroom for about two minutes and came back out with a gun drawn. He told the women that he just wanted to rob them. He bounded them and gagged them with duct tape that he had in his bag that he was carrying. He put the two girls in the bathroom and strangled Carol with a rope as she laid on the bed. He said, I didn't know how hard it was to strangle a person. It was not easy. I had very little feeling. It's like perform. It was like performing a task, he said during a taped confession. So after Carol was murdered, he drug her body outside and placed it in the trunk of their rental, then went back into the room 504, where the girls were waiting in the bathroom. He cut off their clothes and tried to get them to perform sexual acts on each other, but Savinia couldn't stop crying. Carrie said he became so irritated by her sobs that he took her into the bathroom and strangled her while she kneeled in the bathtub. Although Carrie said none of his victims were sexually assaulted, he raped Julie in the family's room and the room next to it, gagging her as he struggled to regain his erection. He then stuffed Sylvania in the trunk where, where Carol was, cleaned up the room, making sure he cleaned up all of his hair, repacked the ladies' items. He wanted it to look as if they just checked out. He said, at that time, I felt like I was in control for the very first time of my life. As Carrie and Julie drove, he removed the tape from Julie's mouth and tried to make small talk. She had no idea her mother and friend was in the trunk. He said he just kept driving, not knowing where he was going to go or what he was going to do. So just before dawn, he turned off of a back road. He took Julie to a clearing in the woods over some water. He carried Julie out of the car, comparing it to a husband carrying his new bride. He said she was so likable and so calm. He told her, I wish I can just keep you. Instead, he raped Julie again, then told her he loved her. He grabbed all of her hair into his hand. Then he slit Julie's 15-year-old throat. He drove the knife in so deep into her throat, he almost severed her head. He hid her body, got back into the car, and drove it deeper into the woods. Then he doused the car with gasoline and set it on fire. Then he called a cab and took it the 90 miles or the 144 kilometers back to Yosemite Valley and paid with the $150 he got from Carol's purse. Jenny Paul, the cab driver, says she remembers her passenger and the strange conversation they had. Once in the car, he asked her, do you believe in Bigfoot? She responded, no. He said, well, you should because he's real. While the FBI was focusing on trying to locate the missing Pontiac Grand Prix, there were calls being made going into Carol's bank using her social security number, trying to withdraw some money. So after a month, they knew it wasn't a car accident like they thought earlier, 
but it was some kind of violent crime. While they were investigating the hotel, one of the employees of the hotel took the FBI on a tour and to count all of the pink blankets. Other employees were being questioned, including Stainer, and they were also given polygraph tests. Carrie expressed frustration that the FBI were even there, asking one of them, why didn't they call the FBI to look for my brother? But at that time, he wasn't even under the radar. At that time, they had no idea, and they thought that Carrie was just normal. But they didn't call the FBI in Merced, California, because they said that there was no evidence that Stephen was taken across state line. And at that time, that's all you had to do is take a child across state line and the FBI would be called. So back to the story. They finally found the car. And when the investigators opened the trunk, they found Carol and Sylvania's body. They were so badly burned that they needed dental records and DNA testing to completely identify them. The location of where the car was told investigators that it was well known to the killer. After Carol and Sylvania was found, Carrie paid somebody to spit in a cup so he could write the FBI letter telling them the location of where Julie's son's body was. He didn't want to leave no DNA. No one knew it was Carrie Stainer. While talking, they would talk about what they should do to the killer, and Carrie would be present in some of these conversations, and he would just sit there and agree. All along, the FBI was checking the wrong leads. So Joy Ruth Armstrong, 26 years old, she worked at Yosemite Institution teaching the children about nature. She led them on nature hikes, and she lived with her fiancé, Michael. He also worked at the Yosemite National Park. Kim Fox, a friend of Joy's, she said, I want everybody to know how happy she was, how amazing she was. She was, she was so spirited. She was so magnetic and so much fun. People have referred to her as a bright star or a bright spark in their lives. Kim said Joy wrote her a letter just before she was killed, and in part it said, you should come see this place. I wonder if you ever will. I love my garden. I love living in Yosemite, one of the most beautiful places in the whole wide world. Her mother, Leslie Armstrong, told the Sacramento Bee a week after her death that she truly strived to be the best person that she could be. The vegetarian had recently climbed both Mount Shasta and a part of Yosemite El Capitan and had a habit of charming pretty much everyone she met with her warm smile and comfortable, approachable demeanor. Her father, Frank, warned her to stay careful after the Carol and Sylvania murders, but Joy and everyone else thought the killers were safe in prison because. The FBI were pretty much arresting everybody trying to figure out if, if they were the murderer. They were arresting all of, all of the past convicts that was over there that had some sort of history of doing things like that. So, yeah. A college student remembered Joy by saying she was just Joy. She was a smile waiting to happen. He said, walking into the coffee shop one day on a particular lonely Valentine's Day with my shoulders hunched and my hands stuffed deep in my pocket. Before I had a chance to order, she was halfway finished with it. I looked up and found her eyes furrowed looking at me with concern. She said something about me looking sad. And I told her that I just broke up with my girlfriend. She smiled and said, well, I'll be your Valentine. It was such a sweet gesture from someone I hardly knew. So every time after that, I would see her walk in the streets, I would call out, yo, what's up, Valentine? And she would turn, smile, wave, and shout it right back to me and move on. Then one day she was gone. 
They said she graduated and went to Yosemite Park to work. At that time, Joy had plans to visit a friend in Sausalito, a city north of San Francisco, for a few days. After that, she planned to visit her grandmother in San Jose. When she never showed up, her friends reported her missing. So on July 22nd, officials were asked to go and take a welfare check on Joy Armstrong. Officers arrived at the scene. They saw her door partially open and he heard music inside and saw her things were all packed. One ranger went inside and said his hairs just stood up on the back of his neck and called for backup. When they arrived, they started a search party. On the porch, there were some broken sunglasses, a tipped over water can. In the bedroom, the bed was a mess and the furniture was askew. There were two sets of tire tracks, crushed branches in the trees, carving out a trail. And that's how they located Joy's decapitated body dressed in jeans and a white t-shirt. Carrie wasn't expecting the fight that Joy had in her. While he was trying to find Bigfoot, he came upon Joy's cabin. And when he saw her loading up her car water and watering the garden before she left, he got out his vehicle. It was a 1979 International Baby Blue Scout with a different tire on each wheel. He started talking to Joy, asking her if she saw Bigfoot in the area. He talked to her long enough to see if she was alone. He told her he only wanted to rob her, just as he did the three ladies in February. He ordered her into the passenger seat into his scout. Joy probably knew that he was going to rape and murder her. So when Carrie got the car going, Joy jumped headfirst out of the window into the woods. Carrie threw the car in park and gave chase and tracked Joy down. He then drugged her further into the woods and then pulled out his knife, made one slice across Joy's throat. Carrie said when he attempted to cut her throat the first time, Joy pressed her neck against her chest. He still was able to make the cut. After doing so, he drug her body a little further, placed his foot on her head, and made another cut. After the second cut, she was still fighting. He then grabbed her legs and started dragging her, After that, she went totally limp. He severed her head and briefly thought about keeping her head as a trophy, but tossed it into the creek with a passing local park ranger back to his cabin. The ranger said he remembered the ride and said there was nothing unusual about the handyman. Joy fought so hard and so long it took up time that Carrie would be able to clean up the scene. Joy bit, kicked, scratched. She fought so much, so hard. All of his DNA was all over her, in her nails, on her clothes, just everywhere. Along with her DNA was all over inside of his car when it was broke down on the side of the road near where the body was. This evidence was how Carrie Stainer got caught. If not for Joy fighting as hard as she had, Carrie said he would have kept killing. Joy is a hero. After Joy's disappearance, people said that they saw a scout truck in the area of her cabin. So they started looking for the scout truck. After reports come in, they learned that the scout truck belonged to Carrie Stainer. They found him sunbathing in the woods, smoking weed in the nude. While getting dressed, he told agents that he was a handyman at Cedar Lodge. They took him in for questioning. He denied being anywhere near Joy's body and where his truck was. But witnesses says otherwise. Since they didn't have enough evidence to keep Carrie, they confiscated his book bag to later get a search warrant for that and his vehicle. He had contemplating keeping the head, but decided otherwise and it was located 40 miles downstream. The next day, they went to Carrie's small apartment at Cedar Lodge and took pictures of his tire tracks and compared them to the tracks that was left at Joy's cabin and found that they were a perfect match. 
Meanwhile, Carrie was selling off all of his items, his television, VCR, and some CDs and his stereo, telling everybody that he had to get his truck fixed because he was moving. When the authorities finally was able to look into his backpack, they found a book called Black Lightning, a fictional story about a Seattle-based serial killer by John Soul, a Corona beer bottle, sunflower seeds, a harmonica, suntan lotion, and a camera that belonged to Carol's son. And I got some of those pictures. I will soon post them on the Instagram. They went to arrest Carrie the next day, but he wasn't at work, which was not normal for Carrie. They searched his cabin and found evidence that tied him to all of the murders. He went to a clothing optional resort just to hang out, and he was at the bar drinking for a little bit. The bartender recognized him from the announcement that the FBI was searching for Carrie Stainer. So what he did, he called the number and then he alerted the hotel manager, Stephen Sailors. Stephen Sailors sent groundskeep to tend the bushes near Carrie's tent. Carrie really didn't think much of the surveillance because since earlier he checked the newspaper and he hadn't seen his name. So that morning he was eating breakfast. When he saw the FBI, he stood up and put his hands up behind his back. They thought that was odd because they only wanted to question him. They took him back to the station and took his mug shot, and then they realized that the last name matched Stephen Stainer. So they asked him, can they ask him questions about his brother? So they sat there and talked to Carrie because everybody said Carrie was a nice guy, and they, didn't, they never would have thought that this would have become him. A crime he planned a day before Valentine's Day, the day before he saw Carol's son, Julie's son, and Sylvania Paleso. He chickened out because a caretaker showed up at the property where they live, and since he already packed his murder kit in his bag, so once he saw Carol, Julie, and Sylvania check in, he basically stalked them. He told investigators, Everything about when he was searching for Bigfoot and instead saw Joy, they first thought it was a crime of passion, but then found out that Carrie himself said that it was because Joy fought so hard. Carrie said that he would tell everything as long as they met a few of his conditions. He wanted to be in the federal penitentiary near Merced, and he requested that the reward money would be given to his parents, offered by the family of Carol's son's family. And he requested what he called, including photos and videos of children who were involved in crime scenes. Agents said no to all the requests, but Kerry started talking anyway. Investigators asked if he forced himself in Carol's room, and he said no. I maintain the handyman role. He continued to tell what all he did to Carol and the girls, describing how he bunched his hair in her hand and pulled her head back before telling her he loved her. He said Julie didn't die immediately. She motioned for him to finish the job. He said there was very little emotion but control. Kerry told the investigators that he knew he'll be getting the death penalty. The investigator agreed then made a promise to carry that in return of his confession, he would personally go to the Stainer home and tell the news to Kay and Dale so they wouldn't have to hear it on the evening news. Because Carrie was a handsome and outdoorsy person, people said he didn't look like a killer. But describe a physical appearance of a killer. That just doesn't make any sense. Carrie provided details that no one else would have known about except the murderer. Everyone was very surprised that Carrie Stainer confessed. They said that he was part of their family. They said there were more creepier guys around that they thought would have done it. After he confessed to the police, he also confessed to Ted Rollins, despite the FBI gag order that he either didn't know about or didn't care about. When asked if he would have kept killing if he wouldn't have been caught, Kerry said definitely. He said he would have killed until either caught or killed himself. 
Ted asked them if he had anything to say to the families of the victims. And Carrie said, and I quote, I'm sorry they were where they were when they were. Carrie pled guilty. August 26, 2002, he was convicted of four counts of first degree murder and is now serving life in San Quentin on death row. His lawyer filed an appeal on his death sentence. It's make it make sense, really. On October 10th, 2002, the jury determined that Carrie would die for the murders of Carol's son, Julie's son, and Sylvina. Joy's trial was separate. Prosecutors would not seek the death penalty just as long as he pled guilty and vowed to never speak publicly about her murder. So Carrie pled guilty and apologized to her mother, family, friends, and her fiance. He said, I wish I can take it all back, but I can't. I wish I can tell you why I did it, did such a thing, but I don't even know myself. I'm sorry. I wish there was a reason, but there isn't. It's senseless. I wish Joy was here, but she isn't. I wish I wasn't, but I am. He never asked for forgiveness. Finally, Mary Ellen Gies, a radio reporter based in San Francisco at the time of staying at the Cedar Lodge covering the ladies' murders, said one night she headed to the hot springs, but a man beat her to it. It was irritating to her because she wasn't going to be alone, so she still went there and she sat down. She said he turned to her and introduced himself, saying, Hi, my name is Carrie Stainer. She said hi. She added, he seemed calm as a cucumber, even though the FBI agents were right around the corner. She said she was more interested in the recent story, Carol, Julie, and Sylvania's murder. While she was trying to get more information out of him on if he knew anything, she said he never looked her in the eye. Instead, he was more interested in what she knew about the murder. She said she started feeling uncomfortable about the way Stainer was looking at her. She took the opportunity to flee the hot tub and go back to her room. Once inside, she locked all of the locks on the door and put furniture in front of the door. When she told some of the workers the next day how she felt, they all said that he was a pretty nice guy, quote. So she forgot all about the encounter until Carrie's confession. She felt lucky to be alive. Although Carrie was sentenced to death for Carol's son, Julie's son, and Sylvania Paleso, his sentence was later commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Carrie hasn't shown any remorse for his crimes and remained incarcerated at the California State Prison in Sacramento. This case had a significant impact on natural conversation around mental illness and criminal justice. Before Dale's death in 2013, he and Kay visited Carrie on a weekly basis while he was being held in Fresno. So that is everything about Carrie Stainer, the Yosemite Park murderer. How did you guys enjoy it? Was it too much detail or was it just enough? All right, Donuts, I just want to say a couple of things. Am I the only one to think that it is really, really scary to know that a seven-year-old was walking around here having so many dark imaginations? Like, why? What? Oh, my goodness. And why is it that a murderer would get caught, admit, and everything, and then... When his life is on the line, he begs, they beg for their life. Make it make sense. All right. So with that being said, I want to thank everybody personally for listening and becoming a part of the fried dough community. I thought I would be alone with this, but I just want to humbly thank each and every one of y'all and to let you know that I see you. So join the Instagram page at fried dough podcast. You can send your case suggestions there. I want to know what you all really want to hear. So stay vigilant, stay informed, and always, 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 Donuts, trust your instinct.